Hello and welcome to podcast.init, the podcast about Python and the people who make it great. When you're ready to launch your next app, you'll need somewhere to deploy it, so check out Linode. With private networking, shared block storage, node balancers, and a 200 gigabit network, all controlled by a brand new API, you've got everything you need to scale. Go to podcastinit.com slash Linode to get a $20 credit and launch a new server in under a minute. To get worry-free releases, download GoCD, the open-source continuous delivery server built by ThoughtWorks. You can use their pipeline modeling and value stream map to build, control, and monitor every step from commit to deployment in one place. And with their new Kubernetes integration, it's even easier to deploy and scale your build agents. Go to podcastinit.com slash GoCD to learn more about their professional support services and enterprise add-ons. And visit the site at podcastinit.com to subscribe to the show, sign up for the newsletter, and read the show notes. Your host as usual is Tobias Macy, and today I'm interviewing Rebecca Bilbro and Benjamin Bengfor about Yellowbrick, a scikit extension to use visualizations for assisting with model selection in your data science project. So Rebecca, could you start by introducing yourself? Hi, Tobias. I'm Rebecca. Uh, I'm a data scientist and Python programmer in Washington, D.C. And Ben, how about yourself? Uh, hi, guys. Yeah, I'm Ben. Uh, I'm a computer scientist. I guess I'm also sometimes called a data scientist, uh, but certainly more software engineering focused. And I also live in Washington, D.C. And Rebecca, again, do you remember how you first got introduced to Python? Yes. Yeah, so I came to Python somewhat recently, so maybe five, five, six years ago after I had already finished graduate school and I had a job post-academic job analyzing what was pretty messy data and looking for practical tools that I could use to sort of augment the research skills that I developed while I was doing my dissertation. I would learned Maple in high school and then in college some Java and some Perl. Uh, so I found Python just a really natural way to express my thoughts. And it was just when data science was starting to happen and I was really excited to see all of the open source Python packages that were sort of rising up to meet that work. And it became clear that something sort of special about Python is that it felt like a really good way to build software and also build experiments. And then kind of starting to go to PyCon, you know, I felt a real affinity for the, the Python community too. And Ben, how about yourself? Do you remember how you got introduced to Python? I do. I've actually, I've been a software engineer for 12 years or so, I guess a really long time. And so when I started uh, doing software development, it was with a variety of systems and scripting languages like Java, C. And I remember that my first, one of my first bosses introduced me to Python as a uh, prototyping code for some embedded C projects that we were doing. So we would program in Python and then once we had everything like sorted out and tested and designed, we would re-implement that in, in C. Uh, but we quickly started using it for web development and system scripting. And as my job evolved, uh, I started doing more cluster computing with Hadoop. And my job was focused on natural language processing, so you know, de dealing with large amounts of text. And so I found a lot of reasons to use Python with Hadoop, using Hadoop streaming and some other packages for NLP, and I was quite relieved when, I, when Spark came along and gave like a full-on <laughs> Python interface to, to that sort of distributed computing. So I've been using it for a long time, but I don't know if I started in the same place that many other people did. <laughs> and so the two of you have gotten involved in building and working with the Yellow Brick project. So I'm wondering if you can describe a bit about the use case for it and how the project got started. Absolutely. So Yellow Brick is about visual diagnostics for machine learning. And where we see it fitting in is, you know, how do you decide what's the best model or what are the right features? And there are sort of a host of mathematical tools for doing that. But, you know, in my career and teaching, I've noticed that, you know, you just can't stare at a bunch of numbers and really come to meaningful conclusions about progress. And so Yellow Brick entered as this way to see sort of more clearly how you were doing, where you were going, if you were going backwards or forwards uh, during the machine learning uh, workflow. Ben and I met because I was enrolled in a data science certificate program that he was teaching for. Um, and so he was actually my machine learning and software engineering teacher. And so some of this sort of just came out of the experience of me being a student um, and sort of talking to my teacher and trying to understand what was happening and, and wanting 
desperately to sort of understand um, as much as I could um, as quickly as possible and spin up that intuition, you know, not sort of being satisfied to just sort of deploy um, scikit-learn without understanding what was really happening. And so this sort of, you know, this came out of like a very close use case for me. And so in order to be able to build these visualizations in a easy and somewhat automated fashion, you've hooked into scikit-learn and extended some of its capabilities and API. So I'm wondering if you can describe a bit about what's involved in creating these visualizations and uh, what what's actually involved in visualizing a machine learning model. So like you say, you know, this is really... Um you know, modeled on the scikit-learn API, which, um, you know, for, for folks who haven't uh, explored it very deeply, it's really kind of an amazing thing. You know, it's it represents sort of the consolidated research and um, domain expertise from a whole lot of, you know, machine learning practitioners and researchers. Um, and it's all sort of coalesced under this unified API that makes it really kind of almost trivial to deploy and test, uh, you know, any number of models. But kind of in order to, you know, visualize the, the models, you sort of have to, you have to have some understanding of that API and um, to know where to kind of hook in so that in scikit-learn, you know, there are estimators and transformers and estimators have a fit method and a predict method and transformers have a fit method and a transform method. And so, you know, part of what you have to decide with visualization is sort of deciding, you know, am I trying to visualize a model, you know, a, um, a fit and predict kind of sequence, or am I trying to visualize a transformation? So, you know, my data was this, and I performed some transformation, and now it is this other thing, and I'm trying to kind of visually compare. So, you know, we kind of think about the uh, machine learning workflow in terms of something called the model selection triple, which originally comes from a, a databases paper that we read five years ago now, six years ago now, that's sort of, you know, tr trying to imagine what uh, next generation databases will be like, um, ones that are sort of built to anticipate machine learning rather than just having machine learning sort of performed on them after the fact. And so the authors sort of talk about the model selection triple, which just turned out to be a really good way that we found to describe how machine learning actually happens in practice. You've got these sort of, you know, these phases where you have sort of a feature analysis, feature engineering phase, and then you move to a model selection, model comparison phase, and then into a hyperparameter tuning phase. And it's iterative and you kind of go through cycles. But, you know, part of really kind of le leveraging the visualizations is figuring out, you know, where to inject visualizations into that workflow. And, you know, I, I just want to add here too that that, that workflow often looks like research code uh, where you have these sort of Jupyter notebooks just full of all this like matplotlib and maybe experimental stuff. And, you know, that sort of annoyed me, I guess. Uh, it wasn't a very strong feeling, but it annoyed me as a software engineer uh, that you didn't have repeatable dry code, that you didn't have a mechanism for, for using these tools to actually see what you were doing. And so we really wanted to create a tool that got out of the way of the machine learning process, got out of the way of the model selection triple process, which I think is what most like visualization inside of a notebook does. It just is like this big block of code, and it really is. I mean, to generate a matplotlib visualization, uh, you're talking about 15 lines of code at least uh, for for a simple visualization. And so, with that in mind, you know, we created Yellow Brick to map to Scikit-Learn's API. So we have this idea of a visualizer, uh, which in itself is an estimator. So we like to think that visualizers learn from data in order to draw uh, something or to draw um, a visual interpretation of that data. And so they have the same API. They, you know, they wrap other estimators. They wrap transformers. They are themselves transformers. You can stick them into pipelines. And then in the end, you know, using yellow brick is as simple as three lines of code, just the same three lines of code you'd use to do machine learning with scikit-learn, right? Import the visualizer, 
uh, instantiate it and then fit it uh, or score it. Although we do have one special method called poof. Uh, so poof is our, our extra method that you have to call in order to actually make the visualization happen to finalize it with you know, axes and setting the limits and titles and, and all of that sort of stuff. And machine learning models have been typically very difficult to interpret and necessarily understand exactly what's happening, particularly when you get into deep learning and neural networks. So what kinds of information are you able to capture and convey in the visualizations and how does that assist in creating an understanding of what's actually happening within that model? You know, it's funny, you mentioned the thing about deep learning. I was going to say, um, I was reading on Twitter yesterday and Neil Conway posted a really funny tweet. It was something like, anyone who wants to write an alarmist op-ed about uh, the dangers of AI should be forced to spend 48 hours using TensorFlow to solve some non-trivial problem. You know, I think that this this work that we're doing is, you know, a lot harder than, <laughs> you know, that it seems. It's not just hard to explain it. It's also hard to just kind of kind of systematically go through the, the process. So in the context of yellow brick, if we're thinking about that workflow, that model selection triple workflow, you know, in the beginning for future analysis and future engineering, you might use something like the parallel coordinates visualizer or RADVIS, the radial visualization, or something like Rank2D. For in the case of parallel coordinates and RADVIS, you can use those to look for class separability in your data um, to see if the data are well suited for a, a classification. In the case of Rank2D, you know, you might be looking for relationships, you know, pairwise relationships between features and potentially looking for things like covariance, you know, or, you know, things that may complicate the modeling process uh, downstream. For the, you know, model selection and model comparison phase, you might be using something like, you know, if you're doing regression, you might be using a prediction error plot or a residuals plot to kind of inspect how effectively different regressors are fitting the data um, and kind of where the error is happening. If you're, you know, noticing heteroscedasticity, you know, distribution errors, uh, those are, you know, very, very easy to see kind of quickly and intuitively with those kinds of plots. And then for the hyperparameter, hyperparameter tuning phase, um, you might use something like uh, validation curves to understand, you know, as you introduce more training data, you know, what's happening to the trade-off between bias and variance. Are you getting to overfit, you know, at some point? Or you might use something like the alpha selection visualizer to see how well regularization is working. Maybe you're using like L1 regularization or L2 regularization to smooth out your data ahead of, you know, some, some linear model. Um, and you're kind of wondering if that, you know, is actually working, if, um, if it is kind of a, helping to reduce that noise. But generally, kind of for, for all of the visualizations in Yellow Brick, we're aiming to kind of expose as much information as possible. So in the same way that Scikit-Learn really provides a lot of access to model attributes, you know, we're trying to do the same thing, you know, make sure that you have access to the scores, you know, the timings for how long it took to, to fit or transform, you know, annotations and you know, those kinds of things to make it to make, you know, make sure we're conveying as much information as possible. And can you dig a bit more into how the visualizations will assist in gaining understanding about what's happening within the various models that people are experimenting with? Yeah, so this is a, a place that we really think that yellow brick shines, um, and that's this idea of steering or visual steering of the model selection process. Uh, the term steering itself comes from the HPC world or the, the high performance computing world. And if you rephrase the model selection triple in terms of a search problem, right? What are the best? What is the best combination of features, algorithm? data and hyperparameters that leads to a model that's operational, something that we can use in our systems to actually make decisions. If you phrase it that way, you see that you're in a really just massive search space. There's a lot of different options. And, you know, that's actually the benefit of machine learning, right? Um, I think one of the joys of having generalized machine learning frameworks like Scikit-Learn available and so easily accessible by a wide number, a wide variety of people is that they can combine these models and data without necessarily having a PhD or a, a deep understanding. They can engage in the search process to find novel and unique occurrences of, of good fits. And 
you know, if, if you're doing that on purpose, that can be very daunting, right? Where do you look? Where do you go? How do you correct your course if you're sort of heading down a wrong path? Um, you know, or should we be using a probabilistic method or a Bayesian method? Is that best, most well suited for this? Should we go down a completely different path and use something non-parametric like uh, gradient boosting or, or random forest? And I think that's what Yellow Brick is designed to do in terms of understanding the models itself, trying to compare two different visualizations of the same model, tweak it experimentally, and then you can see what changes happen in the visualization. So it turns out not to be maybe a, an interpretation of a single visualization, although that's very common once you get to that good search space, once you start honing in on it, you might start to think, okay, well, what does this mean? Uh, how do I interpret the behavior of this model in this data? Do I trust this data? What amount of risk do I take on? But in the initial stages, it's really about comparing different models, comparing dis different instantiations of these triples, and looking for progress as you're making these changes uh, and moving forward. That is certainly my experience of machine learning um, and using yellow brick in, in a couple of different projects and contexts. And as I talk to, to more data scientists, more people who are doing machine learning on a daily basis, I think that they're really starting to buy into this idea of steering, to this idea of visual analytics, where there's a combination of, of sort of this human domain knowledge with this machine ability to generate models very rapidly. And how can you combine those things in a meaningful way to, to find the best model? And yellow brick is a start at that. It's, it's certainly not a comprehensive tool for visual analytics, but it does provide that interpretability that I think is lacking from, from just simple reports or, or numeric scores. So in a way, it helps with going through sort of a human scale Bayesian process where you're iterating on your priors to gain direction in terms of where to go next to be able to come to an effective outcome. Yeah, that's absolutely a, a, a great metaphor for it. You know, how, you know, what do you understand about what you were doing before and how does that affect what happens after? And importantly, it also informs your team, right? It's a good way of, of saying, you know, here's where I came from and here's where I ended up and now you can take the baton and, and go from there as well. So I think the Bayesian metaphor is uh, very apropos. <laughs> and in a way, the visualizations also can help to serve as documentation of your process so that when you're going back later to try and understand what it is that you were doing, you have some way of quickly being able to scan through and say, oh, these are the, uh, these are the things that I attempted. This is where I ended up and then not have to re-explore some of that space. And also for somebody else who's coming into the project, they have that same benefit of being able to just scan through the visualizations and say, these are the models that were attempted. This is why they went one direction or the other. Yeah, absolutely. I, it's it's absolutely critical for me personally. Um, you know, I, I constantly think about future me and what's future going to be going to think about what I'm doing right now and, and having that documentation, having that trail, having that sort of very quick getting up to speed with an experimental process and, you know, also understanding failure. Uh, to a certain extent, right? Like, you know, a lot of times if you think about this experimental process, you're going to fail a lot. And yellow brick document, like this yellow brick visualization serves as documentation to the failure so that you can sort of quickly go back and build from that base and, and sort of figure out what went wrong and, and why without having to maybe retread a rocky path. Absolutely. And is there any way to easily co-locate some of the parameters that were used along with the visualization that was produced so that you don't necessarily have to retain all of the intermediate code, but be able to just quickly see, okay, it was this model, these hyperparameters, and this was the outcome? So the answer to that is no, there's not an easy way to do that. It just, if you want uh, to test yourself a little bit, if you take a scikit-learn model and do get params on it, and you try to JSON and code that thing, uh, you will find that that is a nightmare. <laughs> and it's very <laughs> difficult to do because you have all of these data types that can't be serialized and it's nested and there's references and objects and, and it's kind of a mess. And that's one of the reasons, you know, Rebecca mentioned that we try to include as much information as possible in the visualizations. We want to make them as rich as possible. And part of that is for that self-documenting reason, right? What, what parameters were in this model? What, you know, for example, all of our titles usually have the name of the estimator in the title just so at least you have that for me personally though you know I do have to do a little bit of extra work to coordinate you know I end up pickling 
Uh, my estimator is even, you know, and I just have like this directories full of a mess of pickled estimators, trying to coordinate them with visualizers, um, usually in the form of like markdown files and things. Uh, that's definitely something we'd like to see Yellowbrick do better at. Um, maybe include meta information in the in the image itself. And it's definitely on the list of ideas as we're trying to explore how to coordinate this workflow a little bit better. Or possibly even in some of the EXIF data so that it's not necessarily immediately visible, but you can still extract it from the image and co-locate the data. That's not a bad idea. <laughs> and visualizations can be difficult to get right in terms of figuring out what style of visualization to use, color scales, labeling, you know, how big to make the image, et cetera. You know, the, the distribution of the axes as far as how many units to display. So does Yellow Brick provide any assistance in terms of automatically selecting some of those settings or providing guidance on what types of visualizations to use for different types of models or different use cases? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So Yellow Brick doesn't do a lot stylistically. I think that if we have a guiding motivation, it's for correct interpretation all the time. One example of this is we had a contributor say to us, you know, this, this sort of looks strange, this figure it looks like a little bit warped. And what we realized is we had a 45 degree line, but we didn't have a square image. And so even though it was a 45 degree line, it looked like it was, you know, at, at a weird slope. And so, you know, for us, it's all about correctness more than anything else. Um, although, you know, we do tend to use like Seaborn styles and things to make it look pretty. And, you know, Matplotlib uh, 2.0 is, is actually very good looking, but we definitely focus on, on maybe the utility uh, of the visual visualizers. And for somebody who is just getting started with yellow brick and starting with a greenfield project, what would the workflow look like for getting started and iterating through using yellow brick in that process? So that's a really good question. I think that, you know, we, we've been really focused on kind of building up a base of contributors over the last couple of years. And one of the things that we, we are sort of excited to do, um, you know, this coming year is to kind of get a better sense of the users and kind of ideally what we'd like to do is sort of capture the workflows of professional you know, practitioners and try to encapsulate some of that, you know, and, and map some of that onto Yellow Brick to make it as sort of natural as possible to do what they're already doing. We we conducted like a kind of preliminary usability study last year, but we're looking to launch something kind of more formal in the next couple of months. So something that includes, you know, user interviews with people who've been doing this for a while and maybe focus groups and A-B testing. But for the most part, you know, we're frequently most frequently kind of talking to students about the, you know, building data science uh, products and, you know, working on data science projects. And, and so in a lot of cases for them, the questions that they're asking are things like, which features do I use? And which model do I use? Which model is best? Um, and we always tell them, just try them all and <laughs> compare them visually and then try to, you know, use those visualizations to understand um, why they're performing differently. Um, you know, they frequently get, you know, we get asked, why isn't my model working? And it's usually something like a class imbalance problem or, you know, strangely distributed data, like really sparse data, you know, but those are things that you can visualize yeah, very quickly with yellow brick. But I think like for the, for students, the main thing that we try to communicate is that, you know, whatever your specific um, you know, kind of specific use cases, specific workflow is that it's important that it's not a random walk, that your, that your pipeline needs to be purposeful. Um, it can be, you know, cyclic and iterative, but those iterations need to be associated with hypotheses. Um, you need to be, you know, kind of thinking about hypothesis driven development, conducting experiments and, you know, recording. And as you, you know, you guys were just talking about documentation, you know, documentation, it's really important so you can, you know, understand and compare your results. But, you know, the flip side is that you need to be able to move quickly. Um, you know, so if you're doing a data science project for a class, you know, it's due. If you're doing it for work, um, you know, the client is expecting it. So there's no time to write out, you know, 30 lines of custom code each time or worse to, you know, export the results um, of your uh, modeling and then try to visualize them in some, you know, proprietary tool. So even though, you know, Python isn't always 
students go to for visualization. We really emphasize Matplotlib and, and Yellowbrick because, you know, being able to do everything in Python using open source tools really reduces the entropy and makes that workflow more smooth and iterative so that you can do better science. And, uh, you know, just along those lines, you know, I, I, I can at least tell two stories of how uh, maybe Yellowbrick is used um, and you know, what we're finding is there's like a lot of different ways, like Rebecca said, and there's a lot of different workflows. But, you know, maybe just more specifically, if it's interesting, you know, I had a project, it was a, a regression-based project, and I was sort of coming from the world where I was very used to uh, the modeling effort taking a lot of time, uh, big classifiers or training big neural models or, or something like that. And so, but this new regression project, you know, I maybe had only 5,000 instances and I was building about 30 models at a time for these different uh, segments that I was trying to investigate and they were trained sort of near instantly. And so in that type of scenario, in that type of workflow, I was using Yellowbrick to really manage visually the changes between not just all of these sort of individual models, but then the aggregate model as a whole to get a better sense of, you know, these sort of very small changes that I would make. Did they have a large impact? Did they have a big impact? And try to categorize them just from this broad level, like what was the impact using things like prediction error uh, or the residuals chart. And, uh, you know, it's actually amazing. Like once you've run enough of these things, like you actually get a intuition you get a sense just by comparing, you know, training and test data residuals, you can really start to feel like, am I overfitting my model? Am I underfitting my model? Do I need to make my model more complex? Uh, do I need to reduce the complexity of my model? And it's actually, it's sort of hard to describe in words, you know, because it is a visual tool. You need to sort of see it. You sort of see these patterns emerge. Uh, whether it's areas of very high density in the residuals, whether it's uh, along sort of one part of the target, you'll notice that different models are, like have different shapes. So the parametric models often have very hard lines in the residuals, and you can sort of see like stratification. Same with ensemble models. Ensemble models will like partition different parts of the target, and you can sort of see if, if one part of your ensemble is weaker than another part of your ensemble. What the effect of train test splits and cross-validation has. I really wish I could explain this. I mean, it would be better to show, obviously, this kind of thing, but you start to get that intuition. You can start to get this feel like, oh, I'm going in the right direction, uh, or no, I'm not going in the right direction. And once you start to hone in, you know, you might be using just like a handful of yellow brick tools. Like I was just using prediction error uh, in the residuals plot, but once I started to hone in, then I sort of came back and started doing these, you know, deeper feature analyses with, with rank 2D. Do I have covariance? Do I have different correlations between my features? Are these things affecting my regularization decisions inside of these larger models? And once you start to explore it, I, you know, one thing that I found was you start to get like maybe a deeper understanding of the underlying data. And you start to maybe get that intuition or that sense of what the models are doing and particularly different model families. Like how are they interacting with your data? And it's very specific. I don't know if I could take the intuition I gained in that project and apply it to a different regression, but in that project itself, it, you know, things were very clear for me and I was able to sort of tell, you know, my teammates like, this is what I'm seeing, this is what I'm thinking based on these results and, and they would look at it and they would sort of start to develop that intuition too, even though they weren't in the thick of it during the entire process. I think it's almost like every unique ML exercise ends up with a, a sort of unique yellow brick or visual experience um, and, and I'm hoping it's cumulative that you as you go on to more projects that intuition you know uh, becomes more nuanced so that you can see just see it, what you're doing and what impact it has. And in your experience are there any other tools in either Python or other language environments that provide any sort of similar experience of being able to have this visually iterative cycle of building and testing these machine learning models, or do you find that it's largely unique within the problem domain of data science? You know, yellow brick is such a, a domain specific thing. It's, it's really tied uh, to machine learning. There is another library that is a competitor of ours, I guess, that has a, sort of a similar thing. But I, I will say that, that, you know, when you're using Seaborn for exploratory data analysis, like I think that I get, it's, it's different, but I maybe have that same experience of you know I'm I'm understanding the data in a in a deeper way 
understanding distributions and the visualize, visualizations that Seaborn's producing are enhancing my understanding of the underlying data. And I mean, it's completely different, right? That's for exploratory data analysis. That's for answering questions you know, with your data. It's not about machine learning, uh, but I could see how that would be a similar experience uh, in Seaborn for someone who's doing machine learning with Yellowbrick. And you mentioned a bit about how Yellowbrick wraps these estimators and transformers in scikit-learn, but I'm wondering if you can discuss a bit more about the details of how it's constructed and how the design of the library has changed and evolved over the lifetime of the project. Sure. So, you know, kind of in the same way that scikit-learn has, you know, estimators and uh, transformers, you know, Yellowbrick has tools that are specifically kind of anticipating some kind of scoring, you know, so in the case of, you know, modeling, they're sort of anticipating that you have a machine learning model that's being fit and that you can use, you know, the training and test data, for example, to score how well the model performed. And so it's sort of hooking into the estimator part of the API there. And, you know, there's other visualizers that are more kind of anticipating, you know, data transformations. So one of the ones that I like a lot is the frequency distribution visualizer, which I use a lot because I work a whole lot with text data. And so a lot of times it's, for me, a way to visualize how the corpus sort of is changed or transformed as I perform sort of different kind of operations on it, like stop words removal or certain kinds of, um, you know, key phrase or n-gram analysis. But uh, in terms of how it's changed over time, you know, I think that we got, I mean, we're lucky because we were basing it on a very, very well-established API. The scikit-learn API kind of was, you know, gave us, you know, a really good design to begin with. But I will say, you know, we've had a lot of contributors. We have, I think, maybe 35, maybe 40 contributors now. And every time somebody contributes something, you know, the project changes a little bit. You know, everybody kind of injects some sort of, you know, creative thing that, that, that changes things a little bit. But probably, you know, from, from now on out, it's mostly going to be about adding polish and adding um, new visualizers that sort of capture the best practices that are being used sort of already by folks, but, you know, who are doing it kind of manually and want, you know, want to be able to do it a little bit more easily. I think, you know, the, the steps, the sort of the journey that we took was kind of first sort of hardening the API and then, you know, every time Matplotlib or Scikit-Learn changes, we have to you know, we sort of have to be prepared to keep up with those changes and, and provide, you know, compatibility. But kind of one of the more interesting things recently is that we had to figure out how to do unit testing for plots. And so the visual tests was tricky. And that was something that, you know, we hadn't really thought about from the beginning um, and then had to kind of retroactively implement <laughs> for all of the, the visualizers that we had created. Luckily, we have um, a core contributor, Nathan, who really dug in, um, you know, dug in his heels and, you know, rolled up his sleeves and he figured out how to do the visual tests and he sort of set the, the model for how we'll, we'll all do that moving forward. And currently, Yellowbrick is tied to Matplotlib for doing the visualizations, but do you foresee adding in support for any other visualization tool chains, and, or is it sort of hard-coded to Matplotlib, and that's just going to be your main focus going forward? You know, that's, that's sort of a topic of a lot of debate. I mean, certainly, we get a lot of advantage from using Matplotlib directly, and, you know, I will say that it does play well with other libraries that are also Matplotlib focus, you know, so Seaborn, if you change the styles, you know, I constantly use Seaborn and Yellowbrick uh, side by side. You know, one of the questions I'm constantly asked is, can you modify or manipulate the, the visualization? And the answer is yes, you can access the axes on the visualizer and use uh, any sort of tool that, you know, Matplotlib tool associated with it. And so, you know, I think that there's a few new libraries that are coming out to try to, uh, you know, extend Matplotlib into, you know, into other domains and web domains and things like that. And, and so if, if people do that, then, then Yellowbrick will also, you know, be able to take advantage of those things. You know, however, I, I will say that we're not against other visualization libraries. And, you know, we just started a contrib module to sort of 
try to think about these things formally. For example, another one of our contributors, Craig, uh, just recently wrote a, a blog post on, on districtdatalabs.com uh, where he talks about using uh, R and Python uh, along with matplotlib and, and how to sort of coordinate these things. And his post is actually really interesting. It's on you know, bias and, and fairness in, inside of algorithms. So we don't think that it, it necessarily has to be mutually exclusive, but you know, when I when I look at sort of the visualization landscape, to me, it's it's either something like Matplotlib, where you're rendering sort of raster images, and there is a little bit of, of interactivity uh, inside of a notebook that you can add to to Matplotlib. But then the other side of things is you know tools for visualiz visualizing in, inside of a web application, something like Shiny or Bokeh or something like that. And you know, we we do ask ourselves that question. You know, would yellow brick work well inside of a web context and and we're we're not sure because you know yellow brick is is sort of a single seat user kind of tool right it's not meant for a general audience it's meant specifically for the data scientist who's in the chair who's actually working and interacting with with the modeling process and then for that person to communicate their discoveries i don't know if you made a yellow brick visualization just globally available on a website whether or not that would be meaningful or or interpretable without all the sort of sweat equity that goes into developing that intuition. That said, we do have this feeling that interactivity is going to become a very big part of Yellow Brick in the future. You know, Yellow Brick has sort of a at its heart is a high dimensional visualization tool. Um, and, you know, I like to say there's really only six visual dimensions that you can encode, you know, size, color, shape, all these kinds of things. And, and time is sort of the seventh, right? If we can have a slider where we can drag things or if we can, you know, do this sort of meaningful interaction where we have an overview first and zoom and filter, get details in demand. Uh, we think that that provides sort of a richer visual uh, experience. And so, uh, like I said, when I started, this is this sort of a, a question, you know, is Matplotlib going to take us to that place of interactivity? Are we going to have to look at other tools that are, are maybe more web-driven? Is there a happy medium? We're, we're not 100% sure, although, I mean, there could be, maybe there would be a fork, you know, yellow brick web or something like that, and, and we'd be very interested in, in seeing st tools like that. And what about any other machine learning frameworks? Have you looked at the possibilities of integrating with things like TensorFlow or Keras or any of the others in the ecosystem? Uh, yeah, so, uh, and actually that is the whole reason that the contrib module exists actually is, is for that reason until we sort of thought about formally uh, engaging in other things. So stats models was the first where we had a contributor say, hey, I want to use stats models. There's nothing stopping me from using stats models except that I have to, you know, create an API, like a scikit-learn API or a wrapper for this thing. And so they did, right? They created this sort of fake estimator where, you know, it used stats models under the hood um, and then and the visualizations worked off the bat. Craig, whose post we mentioned before, he actually had uh, historical data and so he created something called the identity estimator that just acted like a scikit-learn estimator but fed information from a file on disk and that was able to allow him to create you know the classification reports uh, rock art curves and threshold things you know to, you know to actually use the yellow brick uh, visualizers and so at PyCon actually several of us had a big discussion well how can we open this up uh, beyond scikit-learn and you know Keras has a scikit-learn interface we suspect that it, it would not be that difficult uh, uh, to include that, you know, the question is is really not if, but when, and how do we hook into these things? Is it going to have to hook in from some sort of underlying pickle? You know, how do we sort of distinguish yellow brick for some, something like TensorBoard? How do we provide sort of a meaningful augmentation to the tools that already exist for things like um, TensorFlow and Keras and PyTorch uh, and things like that? So there is a path in place. Uh, yellow brick is at uh, 07 right now. Uh, I don't think that that there might be some initial pro typing of that kind of that kind of tooling in 08 but I would say that definitely around 09 whose time frame is about the end of this year uh, then we're going to start to see some significant support for for Keras at least uh, moving forward and what have been some of the most challenging or unexpected aspects of building and maintaining and growing yellow brick in its community originally when when we started out working on it it was just me and Ben and at that point it was pretty, it was kind of surprisingly 
easy to just kind of prototype out, you know, a single visualizer from uh, from beginning to end. Now that is, you know, a little less straightforward. Um, you know, the the idea part, the prototype is, you know, still kind of fun and, and exciting. And then there's sort of the work of writing the tests and the visual tests and doing the documentation and all of that. And it's one of the things that we, you know, we do think about, we want to make sure that people feel like they can contribute and enjoy the sort of the fun part and not feel kind of too burdened by the um, the rest of it. So we offer, you know, a significant amount of support to contributors, you know, to kind of get them to the finish line. And so one of the things that we work really hard at is striking the right tone uh, in the dialogue of our issues and with pull requests and code reviews, even with each other. You know, if it's just core contributors communicating with each other, you know, those things are visible to everybody. And, it, you know, it's important to set the right tone so that people know that we're welcoming and, you know, we're all excited and we respect each other and admire each other and, um, you know, are, are interested in, in other people's sort of creative ideas for implementation. You know, some of the challenging things are support for, for platforms, especially Windows, um, has been a little challenging. I guess we'll all see what happens now with the um, GitHub <laughs> uh, kind of being bought. Um, you know, potentially we're looking forward to a future of, you know, slightly less challenges, uh, potentially looking for silver linings there. Python 2.7 support is an ongoing struggle. <laughs> you know, we, we just kind of put out a survey to the users, the, our community of users asking whether or not uh, they might be open to not having 2.7 support anymore because it is kind of a, a pain in the neck. <laughs> And in the process of working with Yellow Brick, what have you found to be some of the limitations or edge cases that it doesn't cover yet or that you possibly don't intend to have it cover? So yeah, this is a great question. I, you know, one of the things that is most striking perhaps is the fact that Yellow Brick has a smaller data cap than Scikit-Learn does. You know, you can only draw so many things. And, you know, whereas Scikit-Learn is implemented with a lot of C support, uh, Yellow Brick is mostly pure Python. So uh, performance can also become a very, you know, real issue, especially if you're trying to deeply integrate Yellow Brick with, you know, Scikit-Learn using pipelines uh, or, or some other toolkit. So, you know, we recently had this with uh, parallel coordinates. We noticed that uh, parallel coordinates was getting slower and we didn't really know why. We just knew that we had these sort of benchmarks that were just, you know, starting to crawl. And we knew that we couldn't let that affect the machine learning process, right? We want these visualizations to be an aid, and not something that you have to do and not something that gets in the way uh, of the process. And so, you know, our first tack at that was coming from the approach of this, you know, data cap. Well, maybe we can add in some sampling, right? And just, you know, take a uniform random sample or a stratified sample of the instances and only display those things. And that definitely eased the problem. And, and you know, it wasn't a 100% solution. Uh, one thing that did come of that is we noticed that you can actually use different sampling methods and compare different sampling methods. And it, there's sort of like a, an idea for an interactive uh, type thing that's sort of similar to brushing uh, in parallel coordinates. but. You know, as we dug deeper into the problem, we started realizing, well, and this is one of our contributors, Kyle at PyCon, sort of noticed this. Well, we're, we're visualizing or we're drawing, you know, one thing at a time, which means that as you add more data, the slower this thing is going to become. So instead of drawing everything one at a time, every instance one at a time, why don't we just draw the class as a whole and insert NANDs, you know, in the middle so that the lines looked correct. And boy, Heidi, I mean, Kyle's implementation was something like 245 times faster. We went from, you know, 30 second uh, fit times down into the into the millisecond range. Like uh, we were just stunned by how fast this new implementation was. And we start to think to ourselves, like, oh man, like, are we, <laughs> you know, what have we been doing? Or are we really? Uh, do we need to review all of our visualizations and, and make sure that that we're not doing things? But as we continued through this process, we realized, oh, actually, this comes at a cost. When you're drawing an instance at a time and you're giving them an opacity, uh, these sort of, you know, the opacity is additive one instance at a time and you can start to see 
these dense braids of, of instances, which is what you're looking for, right? You're looking for clusters or groupings or any sort of coordination across features, and you're looking for those braids. And that only happens, the additive opacity thing only happens in the drawing one instance at a time, and it does not happen when you draw a class at a time. Uh, and instead you only get that sort of darkening effect between classes. So, you know, in the end we said, okay, well, I guess we'll provide both of these options, you know, so there's like a fast parallel coordinates and, and, a, and a regular parallel coordinates, I guess, so they allow the user to choose how they want to tackle this visualization problem. But that is certainly a challenge that we're going to continue to face. Um, you know, visualization just has limitations, both in terms of, of time uh, and in terms of space that you have on the image. More and more, we've been trying to ensure that the underlying implementations are using NumPy, that we're taking advantage of NumPy's performance uh, wherever possible. We try to avoid you know, Python objects where we can, uh, especially since you know, we're in that SciPy world, just ensure that that we're that we're sort of following the same types of steps but this also leads to this sort of other interesting problem and that's when either you know we we sit on top of both matplotlib and scikit-learn and when either of them chokes like raises an exception that bubbles up through yellow brick and you get these very unintelligible tracebacks bug finding becomes an issue um, and so you know if there's one thing i want to say you know these limitations are are certainly there but the fact that they aren't as noticeable is because of the extremely hard work of our contributors uh, to go and find these things and capture exceptions and write better uh, traceback messages and give advice on the documentation of how to handle things. It, it really has been impressive with, with how much work they're doing. In the end, you know, the biggest thing is that, you know, in terms of edge cases, visual meaning depends on the data and the model that you're using and the edge case I think is is possibly disappointment so we you know this and this is something maybe I feel a lot more maybe than other people so one of the new visualizers I just recently implemented was a, a manifold uh, visualizer using TSNE uh, or isomaps or other embedding techniques to try to do a, uh, an embedding instead of a projection of high dimensional space into, into two dimensional space. And I thought, oh man, this is gonna be great. This is gonna provide a lot of functionality and you're gonna be able to see a lot of different groupings and, and it's gonna be a tool that's gonna be widely used. And those tools are, are performance intensive and they can take you know hundreds of seconds to, to draw, to fit and draw. And uh, you know the first real world quote unquote data set that I tried this on, I ended up with like one point, like it just embedded everything right on top of each other. <laughs> and so you know it was just the data I had, it was just you know the tools I had uh, available. And, and so I think that that's maybe the biggest, I don't know if you call that an edge case, but the sort of biggest limitation is, is both you know your data and your model and what that ends up being in terms of visualization because it, it will be unique. It will be a different experience. And looking forward, what are some of the things that you have planned for the future of Yellow Brick? So we're really interested in kind of capturing more users and, you know, figuring out more of the domain practices that are already being used that we can create you know, visualizers with, you know, hopefully in collaboration with those, you know, practitioners that correspond to use cases beyond the ones that we're the most familiar with. You know, machine learning is a really big space. It gets used in a lot of different disciplines. And there's a lot that, you know, I'm sure is out there that people are, you know, kind of doing manually now that would be, and that's sort of, you know, that's what makes scikit-learn so great. You know, it sort of became this place where all of these different uh, practitioners came to contribute. Um, so we would really like to have something like that um, in Yellow Brick. Um, so we're, you know, we're hoping that we can get more people to find the project, you know, on GitHub and star it and check out the docs, reach out to us through the issues and, and kind of share their ideas or share um, case studies from things that they're working on um, so we can get kind of a, a sense of, of what else we could be doing. And then from the future side, or the feature side, uh, we're looking at doing visual optimizations. Uh, I think that's kind of the next big thing for me. Uh, thinking about how can we minimize, maximize 
white space, opacity, overlap? How can we actually use the sort of modeling process and start the, of the visualizations themselves? A lot of the visualizations depend on the order of the features or the order that you draw things. And, and so can we apply maybe a more uh, rigorous method in, in selecting the, the best visualization, the best possible visualization for the model? This also leads to sort of another maybe thinner idea that we have, and that's, is there such thing as, as visual correlations? Something that exists inside the visual space that doesn't necessarily exist inside this uh, inside of the statistical space. So, you know, one thing that we're thinking about is using voxel-based approaches, where we sort of draw a voxel over any dimensional space that's, that's been plotted by visualization, and we look at the density of the points or the lines or the, the drawing, the colors that are inside that space, and use that number uh, as as a representation of the goodness of that visualization compared to the goodness of another visualization. Coincidentally, that's more or less how we do the visual testing <laughs> to see if, if, two, if a baseline image has changed from our test image. I mentioned this before, interactivity uh, is certainly uh, the next phase of features along with the contrib library and Keras support and better stats model support. And then the last thing is, is better reports and organization. The one thing is, you know, I've noticed that, you know, you're never doing just one visualization per model. You usually have a handful or a deck of visualizations per model. And so the question is, how can we group these things together? Can we come up with, uh, you know, like a flipbook model? So, you know, like inside of a notebook, you, you just, you can flip through the visualizations uh, one at a time. Is a visual grid better where we just create sort of a, a report and, and create a grid? Should we be creating, uh, you know, HTML templates with Jinja where we're writing Base64 encoded images into an HTML file that you can open up inside of a web browser? Maybe something kind of similar to TensorBoard, but more yellow brick focused. So those are the types of, of features uh, that we're thinking about as we're moving forward. And beyond visualization, what are some of the other areas that you would like to see innovation or additional tooling come forth in terms of how data science is taught or conducted to make it more accessible and understandable for more people? So one of the things that I observe is that you know, in in practice, I'm seeing data science sort of being used in one of two ways. So one as sort of business analytics 2.0, so where data scientists, um, you know, are maybe in some kind of standalone office in their organization, and their job is to, you know, use machine learning, use visualization, do analysis that kind of goes into some sort of business reporting that goes to management, and then, you know, decisions are sort of made based on that. Um, and then the other model is where data scientists, you know, occupy maybe a somewhat less glamorous position, but are actually embedded in the engineering team. So they are building um, features that kind of just go into the software, integrated into the software. And, you know, as somebody who's more kind of on the second um, in the second category, um, I think that one of the big, biggest challenges that I face, and I think Ben would agree with this, is that a lot of the problems you face are sort of more mundane. It's not like, you know, is my model working or like, what's the best TensorFlow architecture to eke out, you know, the most performance, but things like how does experimentation that I do fit into the agile workflow? Or how do I get, you know, these backend developers who don't know very much about machine learning to approve my pull request so that I can actually get my stuff integrated into the software? Because ultimately, you know, the machine learning stuff is really unpredictable and it comes with uncertainty and risk from a corporate perspective. And we haven't really totally figured out as a community how to work effectively inside that sort of development environment. But my sense is that the skills that really need to be taught to data scientists kind of as we move forward um, into, you know, the next generation of data products is really software development skills. So things like testing and configuration management security, microservice architecture so that you know how to actually um, deploy the, the stuff that you're building. We're also sort of looking forward to a new generation of project managers, product managers who are really, you know, more savvy about uh, data product construction so that they can really help mitigate the risk um, and kind of plan around it and support data science development throughout kind of that model selection triple workflow that we talked about. And are there any other aspects of yellow brick or any other things that we touched on today that you think we should discuss further uh, before we start to close out the show? 
I mean, we definitely want to hear from Yellow Brick users. I'd say that's that's the number one thing. Um, we have a lot of stories that we can tell about Yellow Brick and, and how it's used. I think you've heard a lot of them, uh, both from the user side and the, and the development side. It's been a very important project uh, to both Rebecca and I, and we want to make that project uh, more widely used. Um, and to do that, we want to incorporate feedback from others so that we know how to sort of what features are, are most meaningful um, and how we can make the library as, as general uh, as possible. And so with that, I'll have you each add your preferred contact information to the show notes. And I'll thank you both for taking the time to join me today and discuss the work that you're doing with Yellow Brick. Uh, It's definitely a very interesting project and one that seems like it's providing a lot of value. So thank you for that. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much for having us.